Thank you very much for joining us here again on PM Express. Um, I'm pretty sure you followed the, in the last, what, four months, the elections have been over. New government has been sworn in. Uh, we have a very interesting architecture in parliament, the first in our history, where both parties are split down the middle, with the third most important person in the country being from the opposition party. I'm talking about the speaker. We've never seen that before. And some say the NPP lost ground and that the NPP's loss was the MPP, what the NDC's gain, explaining why the NDC gained so much seats, so many seats to come to 137. Um, my guest is a man who was at the helm of affairs at the party campaign structure, the MPP's campaign structure, I mean, when the party uh, went into the 2020 elections. There's an internal review where the party has been uh, conducting and a lot has been, we've heard from the EC also, assessing their own performance as, uh, in the last election. There's a lot to talk to him about. And also the party is approaching another leadership contest, both the uh, party's national executive and the big one, a change in the leadership of the flag bearership. It's inevitable now, they'll need a new face for 20. 24 and already the talk about who succeeds Nana has started. I wonder what his thoughts are on that also. All that here on PM Express tonight with the 2020 campaign manager for the MPP, a former chairman, national chairman of the party, uh, Peter McMenu. Always a delight to have him on PM Express. Um, Uncle Mark, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm happy that you're joining us for this conversation. I've been uh, looking for you for a while uh, since after the elections. I'm happy that. Uh, I can talk to you on, uh, on so many issues. Let's start with the elections. We had a verdict from the Electoral Commission uh, declaring that the 2020 elections was the most peaceful, most well-coordinated, uh, most transparent, most efficient, and most cost-effective in our fourth Republican history. You've seen it all. You agree? I keep saying that Every election must see an improvement over the previous one. From 1992, that has been the case. 1996 mm -hmm. saw an improvement over 1992. 2000 saw an improvement over 1996 because that was when uh, colored voter ID cards were introduced into the system. Before then, we had the black and white. Uh, people's name could not be found on the register, etc. Mm. And as we all know, in 1992, there was a complete boycott by the NPP because of a whole lot of uh, how the elections were conducted. Mm. So moving forward, we've seen improvements over 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, and equally, 2020 has been a major improvement mm. over uh, 2016, no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Yes, I saw a major improvement. So you, you're using the word major improvement. The EC is different. The EC says it's the most peaceful, transparent, efficient, um, transparent, I've used that word already, uh, cost effective elections in the Fourth Republic. Is that what, that's what I'm asking whether you agree? You see, in this same building, in 2016, 2017, when Codeo came for a review, I put it across that the cost of elections per voter in Ghana is astronomically high compared to other African countries. And it became a debate on this platform four years ago. So if we've come here four years later and we have seen dramatic changes in the cost, lower cost of elections, abate the COVID-19 additions, then it's a big plus. So I'm saying it's a major. If you look at the logistic deployment, it's also a critical factor in elections. That's why on D-Day, you go to certain polling stations, they say ballot papers have not arrived, ballot boxes have not arrived, etc. But I was in second D to witness 
logistics in the form of BVDs, biometric verification devices, ballot papers, polling booths, etc., that were dispatched from the National Electoral Commission to the regions. Mm. And everybody from the party in the regions went to witness it. And I went to witness it in second day. That was two clear weeks to the elections. That was quite good. That was quite good. So you could see that on D-Day, we didn't hear in these 2020 elections anything of ballot papers had not arrived. It's 2 o'clock. We are now going to start voting at Ayawaso, etc., which has predominantly happened in previous elections. So the process was quite good, seamless, flawless. But it couldn't have been the most peaceful. I'm, well, at least I mean, five yeah, people died. I, I, not, I'm not a scientist to be saying peace, but no. I'm saying that it's an improvement over 2016. Yeah, but That's yeah. what I'm saying. So it's an improvement, but it's but not the best if, compared to the let, let, me, let me tell you, if I say every election has seen an improvement over the previous one, mm -hmm. and this one is an improvement over then 2016, it's, it yeah, it's be down to... But let's isolate the most... Let's isolate the most controversial one, the most peaceful. That can be the case, can it? Because this is the election that saw the most deaths. Look... Look, nobody wants death in, in, in any of our electoral activities. And uh, yesterday, Dr. Chambers said what quoted what uh, Nigerian former president, uh, Jonathan, mm. said that not a single life must be lost because of elections. I agree and I totally endorse that. Mm. Today, the security, the National Election Security Task Force was here to do a presentation about 2020 election security. And from the paper they presented, apart from Teshiman South, where they have not been able to get hold of the perpetrators of the crime, because according to them, the presentation, shots were fired from the crowd at the coalition center towards the security and they fired back so they are unable to tell us at now whether the shot that killed the, 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 the do I call them spectators or activists or the people were from the mob that has assembled there or were from the uh, security uh, side it's under examination and we must learn from it to prevent it so to prevent it is important. We must look at what gave rise to these things. It's the collation system. How people amass themselves around the collation centers. What were they going to do? What were they going to do at the collation centers? What were they at the law, the CI 127, specifies who and who are entitled to go to the collation centers. You're not centers. saying that justifies the killing, do you? I am not saying that, but I'm saying let's go to the roots because we don't want a repeat of that in 2020. Do you? No. Okay, so let's go to the roots. I do not think that the mob or the spectators fired at will. Neither do I think it was proper for the security people to also fire at them. But, but isn't that what renders the EC's assessment on the bit of the peace aspect? Inaccurate. Let me tell you, election is a process. So even your issue of election is a process. A process of uh, uh, voter registration, uh, uh, logistics, campaign, campaign era, D-Day, before D-Day, deployment of logistics, uh, recruitment of uh, uh, temporary staff, training them, etc. So it's a whole complex mm. issue. So there may be some gaps, but I'm saying overall, it was an improvement over 2020. You've talked about improvement over 20 2016. No, 2016. Sorry. You say one of the key areas is to improve the collation. Um, what about the collation must we improve? Well, you see, Techima South has 265 pooling stations. Mm -hmm. 265. So one. You need the infrastructure, the building that can house or accommodate 265 people with two ballot boxes by them, one parliamentary, one presidential. So if you don't have that infrastructure, the whole place becomes congested 
and that leads to chaos. Mind you, the business, the core business of collation is adding up figures from the pooling stations. So you need a serene atmosphere to do the arithmetic calculations, not the congested, chaotic situation. Okay? So when the, 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 the collation center is unable to accommodate that number of people, mm. it creates that tension, that congesting, and sometimes it explodes as it did. Meanwhile, because of our time frame of putting an end to the voting, which is five, people will come from their polling stations to come and look at the collation from various polling stations, from various electoral areas. When they come, the people are in there, in the building, the congested building, still doing the arithmetic. And they will be shouting at them. They are stealing. They are changing figures. They are doing this. And these are picked by some of the local media houses into the airwaves. So others rushing to come and see whether what's going on is true. Then the security will try to ward them off. The ensuing melee would lead to firing of guns from both sides, which is not called for, which is uncalled for. Very unfortunate, and it led to the death of some people. Why do we do that at collision? So what should be done? We must correct the infrastructure and the systems that are used at our collation centers. Um, so, so let's talk about collation. Remember after the elections, uh, the NPP announced, NDC said we're going to challenge some parliamentary results. You also, I think if I'm not mistaken, you said there were eight constituencies. Was it eight? Yeah. That you also said we're going to challenge. What's the status of that? Oh, as I speak, last week, uh, Senate West, sorry, um, Crutchy West, um, Pusiga. Pusiga is a case where we lost by 62 votes, mm -hmm. but there were 1,600 plus rejected uh, ballot papers, which is, I mean, uh, so we need to go into the boxes again to look at the ballot papers, if indeed uh, 1,000 plus of ballot papers were rejected and we lost by 62 votes. This is a matter that needs to be looked at. So we are calling for the opening of the ballot boxes for a recount from the uh, High Court. That's what we are looking for. We have um, Asin North and Jomoro, which is a citizenship issue because the NDC candidates in these two constituencies, uh, according to our constitution, should be fully blown citizens of Ghana mm. at the time of filing right. their nomination. But we are saying that is not the case. It's left for the courts to decide. And uh, the status is that uh, we were not getting the NDC MPs to serve them, so our, our lawyers applied for substituted services, was granted. So we were to post a copy of the notice on the notice boards and the, a copy in the national dailies, Daily Graphic and the uh, Ghanaian Times, which we did. And when we did that, they responded and the court has set a date for the trial. So, so you filed uh, processes in court for all these? For areas. all these, okay. for all these, yes. But, but here again, you have a challenge. And they have also filed, filed a, yeah. okay. so they are responding. They I mean, have also filed some charges against, against you yes, on some of the areas that we, we, we're seeing. Yes. But isn't this really a fruitless exercise? Knowing how slow the parliamentary adjudication process is when it comes to disputed you, parliamentary elections. You see, uh, this has been discussed here at this Cordeo Forum. I cannot uh, justify, I do not personally understand the reason why the Rules of Court Committee made amendments to the presidential uh, section, mm -hmm. which cuts 
the time short from the eight months or so in 2012, 2013. So just a little bit over to, a month. To 42 40. days yeah. and refused to touch the parliament. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know why the court rules come. Should they? You back those who say reduce the number? Oh, I think so. I think so. Because looking at the example of uh, Ayawa Subogon, and it's not only Ayawa Subogon. In 2012 uh, uh, elections, there were some parliamentary petitions that ended only in January 20, 2020. So uh, it's not the best. So, so, so let me ask you then, do you accept that what the processes you started to challenge the parliament is just symbolic, that you don't really expect that... No, you see, anything in, our, in our case, as I told you just now, two of the issues border on citizenship. Yeah. That's the point for challenging the actual challenging results. Challenging the actual results. Okay, the citizenship one is a straightforward case. Mm. And if you remember the late Adamu uh, yeah. Dramani, he went through it, so the precedent is there. Mm. And it's clear. But you have six other cases that are So purely, six other cases, yeah. which... I guess my question to you is that, knowing the history of the delay, are well, you hopeful that anything meaningful will come out of that? I think so. Because from, from the... Exp I have personally been to court in Wenji, in one of the cases. And from what I've seen, and from what my respective officers and field candidates in the other regions have brought to my attention. I think there's been some speed compared to the previous era, except that it is not coded. Mm. Okay, yeah. So you, you actually honestly, sincerely expecting that the court would, will put you in parliament and take the NDC winners out of parliament? Oh, I mean, you think the court is not capable of doing that? It does the right thing. It has the power to. So if well, we, you, if the court grants us the permission to go and open the ballot boxes for Pusiga, and we examine it in the court and come out to even find 30 ballot papers, 35, no, 35 ballot papers that had been wrongly uh, declared as rejected. Declared as rejected. We win. Because the 35 will reduce the NDC's win. And you win by two or three votes. After the elections, um, you set up a committee to look into why you lost so many seats in Parliament. What has happened to that committee? Oh, they are finishing, they are the finishing touches. Stage. It's been three months since. They saw oh, yes. They are, I, I inquired. I have appeared before them. You were, you were subject of their inquiry? Well, I have appeared before them. I have written a statement to them. They went to other parts of the country. And the last time I inquired from them, they said they were, fin they were putting finishing touches mm. to their report. So I expect that maybe even next week or so, they may bring it down. Did you admit that, yeah, I failed the party this time in your statement before them? Now, let me tell you something. You must look progressively at MPP's parliamentary position from 1992 to date. And you realize that we've always been the best. And mind you, in the 20... In terms oh, wait, Parliament. Parliament. In 2012. But in 1992, we boycotted, we had zero. In 96, we went in the first time, we had 66. In 2000, we had 98 and there were two independents, and we won the presidential. In 2004, we went up from 98 to 130-something, uh, and the seats were increased to 230. So we have progressively... With exception of 2020. Yes, but even in 2020, and I'm telling you, we didn't lose, okay? Because one, we won the presidential slot, one touch. We'll come on the presidential. We'll come to the then, Parliamentary, you lost votes. So parliamentary we are investigating these losses. We will know what, what transpired. But fundamentally, evidence says you lost Where ground. Where is the evidence? You lost ground in Parliament. N numbers don't lie. Seven, when oh, you were I, in the I, highs I, of 169. I'm saying, I'm saying that from 2012 to 2016, NDC lost ground. Yeah, but I'm talking about the MPP. Yes, well, but I'm talking about poli po uh, I, 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 I get po it. competitive politics. I, I, I get it's it, but I'm just, from, from, I'm just Listen, going, from 2016 no to 2020, you lost uh, look, uh, a lot of seats. I'm asking you, do you accept 
personal responsibility for this because you are the campaign manager? I would accept after the report from the committee comes up. Mm. I don't fear accepting because they, they will make you grow. They will make you look at what went wrong and to improve upon it. And as a human being, you must be able to accept faults and deal with them. That's the nature of me. Mm. I, don't, I don't fear accepting uh, blames and faults, provided they are squarely my own. In light of that, the president recently finalized his full list of ministers, deputies and substantive. In the final list that came, he never gave, he never rewarded any of his MPs in 2016 who lost in the 2020 elections. Every single former MPP MP who lost his seat didn't come back into government. You, you, what does that say? Well, that's the, pre the president is the appointing authority. Mm. And that's the way he wants it. So I'm not going to challenge that. I mean, but, but you, you think he's so he saying... he tells that people must work hard. Okay. People must work hard to be in his government. Some say so that's the, that's that's the, that's signal. That's the lesson or the signal is that parliamentary candidates must work hard to win their seats to be in government. Yeah. And mind you, the constitution also says that over 50% or so of his appointees must come from Ministerial parliament. appointees must come from parliament. Mm. So you can't even blame him. I want to take a quick break. When I return, we'll be talking a bit about the NPP as a party going into 2024 with all the big decisions that the party has to take internally. Uh, they would need to elect new executives. But most importantly, they will have a new face on the ballot in 2024. That is a big deal for any political party. Um, and I'll pick his brain on that. Plus, I'll take his opinion on other big reforms that have been suggested over the last few months going into 2024. Stay with me. We are still live on PM Express and my guest is still Peter McMenu. He's a man who led the NPP into war in 2020. Um, he is, of course, still very uh, vocal and, and taking a leadership role in the party going forward. He is renowned for his experience in the electoral architecture of this country and beyond, and I'm delighted that he's my guest. Um, Mr. McMino, let's. Uh, I want to come back and talk a bit about your party. Is the MPP at a crossroads? I'm sure you've seen this before when um, Edu Bwahin was handing over to Kufour. It, there's always tension. Kufo handing over to Nanado, that was the biggest of all. That's when I began to, um, you know, nest my own political interests watching the MPP. Now you're back there again. Your party's at the crossroads, you know. Well, I have seen it all, as you have rightly said. Uh, particularly, President, former President Kufo handing over to Nana Kufuado at the party's congress at Lego. Yeah. I mean, I chaired the congress as then chairman of the party. Mm. And uh, you see, politics is a dynamic business because you deal with human beings and human beings are not stupid. 